Wine plantations in the Otways were first established about uh, 1929. And we've really got to go back in time to see how it all came about. In the uh, 1880s, the whole of the Otway range was actually opened up for selection. And so uh, because people still wanted land or there was a big, big movement for people to get on the land, they selected these properties uh, along the Otway Ridge. Uh, the reason probably was because if it grew good trees, it must be good land. Uh, selectors moved in and they selected these uh, blocks, in most cases sight unseen, and most of the people who selected them uh, also had little or no farming experience. And of course this became uh, very obvious once they actually got there and found out that they couldn't actually operate the farm. Uh, when selections were taken up on account of out here at Cullick and all the, the best land and that had all been selected so they opened up a lot of the Otways for selection then and from Forest, Barramunga right across to Beach Forest on the north side of the Alangla Weir I understand there was not a block of land that was any good that wasn't taken up for selection then. And the selections, each one of them, I think it was 320 acres allowed for each person that selected it on 40 years to pay for it. father and six other uncles selected the Stevenson Falls uh, Valley known as Upper Gillibrand before 1900 that was. The family come to the Beach Forest area in 1896 and we uh, Father and uh, uncles were both uh, did a lot of labouring work around the area, and uh, they were working on the Apollo Bay Road, the first road that was put into Apollo Bay, and uh, they were being paid nine pence a cubic metre, and they used to walk across the paddock and that, and, and Dad said one day he said. Oh, Oh, I wouldn't mind selecting this block here. And uh, he built a hut and started off in at Beach Forest. They were south of Beach Forest, about a mile south of the township. But uh, Dad mainly worked uh, as, as a labourer around the place for anywhere they could get work. Well, in 1902, the, the railway eventually got to Beach Forest. It had been promised for many years, but it finally got there in 1902. And once the railway came to Beach Forest, it really opened the area up because settlers then had a reliable source of transport to get produce in and to get produce out. And of course, one of the products that went out was uh, the timber. At uh, some stages, almost the entire the volume of freight that went on the train was timber from Beach Forest area. Because of this timber boom, a lot of the settlers that had, had gone on these blocks and uh, were unable to farm it because of the, the climate and the lack of roads and so on, and the lack of finance, 
they started to look then at the timber as a, a way of actually making a living. And so a lot of the farmers actually went off their farms and started to work for the sawmen, cutting the timber, and that gave them a reasonably good living. Some also tried to work their farms at the same time, but uh, that was a big change, the way the people around Beach Forest actually made a living. World War I had a, an impact as well, with many uh, soldiers and, uh, taken from the area for, 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 the, world, for the war. And, um, and then to top it all off, in 1919, uh, disastrous bushfires swept through there and it actually wiped out just about all of those that were left in the Air Valley and they had no hope of recovery. The 1919 fire that wiped out an endless amount of homesteads, buildings, but many people left the Otways after the 1919 fire. Well, after the settlers moved out from Beach Forest, the land really laid as wasteland. And because the forest had been removed and there were no seed source there, uh, the farms were covered then with blackberries, bracken ferns and various types of weed and it was just uh, scrub and so on. And now it stayed like that for quite some time and then in the uh, early 1920s the Forest Commission actually started to purchase land back. The Air Valley south of Beach Forest was the largest of these acquisitions and in 1929 the first plantings commenced. The government had been experimenting in pine for many years at, at Creswick and Macedon and other places and, and uh, although uh, some people called pine just a weed, it soon became obvious that pine grew very quickly and we were importing a lot of uh, softwood from overseas, from the Baltic countries and so on, and so the government decided that uh, they would plant pine for the future. Pine grew actually twice as fast as, as Mount Nash and, and it was a very versatile species as well because there was no waste in pine, you cut the whole lot, whereas in uh, Mount Nash and other hardwood timbers the heartwood was, was not suitable, whereas pine you just cut up the whole lot, heartwood and all. Once the land had been purchased back by the government and handed over to the Forest Commission for the pine plantation, then camps were set up and uh, the rubbish and weeds were actually cleared off and uh, people were moved into these camps to actually do the planting. A nursery was set up there as well to, to grow the pines actually on the site in the Air Valley and uh, a lot of Yugoslavs and Italians and so on were employed there in the planting of the pine. Uh, the planting of this pine stretched over a very long period of time from about 1929 when it started and it was still being planted uh, right up I think until about 1954 or somewhere like that. Uh, an uncle of mine and a stepfather worked there and uh, they used to walk from uh, Beach Forest down over the Air Valley, over the Air River and up to the Sea View camp. Ten minutes late, they would be stood down and docked a quarter of an hour. Those chefs worked wet or fine. By 1938, they started a thinning program which was a commercial thinning project. And so they could actually take the thinnings out as pulpwood, in pulpwood billets. And these were taken up to the Beach Forest Railhead loaded on the beachy train in billet form and taken off to the Maryvale paper mill for the production of paper. I can remember Beach Forest when there was a baker shop, a butcher shop, there was a fruit shop, there was a bank oh, and a large draper shop. 
Jim Fry would be over there with his old truck, an old 27 model Chev, carting the groceries off the train to the shop. No, it was a thriving, because those days the train used to run every day and cart timber from the sawmill. And when they really got into the pulp, there were many uh, tr railway truckloads of pulp taken out every day. In the late 1950s, the pines were ready to harvest. The Forest Commission started a roading program to allow this harvesting to take place and allow the trucks and machinery to go in and harvest the crop. The next plantings were at Webster's Hill up behind Barramunga. And then later on, about the 1970s, they commenced a planting program at Yorga and also at Boona. In the upper Gellibrand area, for instance, uh, now known as Stevenson's Falls, this was uh, operated by the Stevenson's family from the early 1900s. The last remaining farm was sold there by Albert Stevenson. It operated then for a short while as a farm and was then taken over by a private timber company and planted up in Pinus Radiata. And what we are looking at here today is the, the harvesting of that timber that was planted back then. In this steep uh, wet country, um, cable logging is being used to haul the logs to the landing. This principle is similar to what was used for uh, hardwood logging in the early days uh, when steam winches were used. Yeah, well the machine's a Thunderbird TMY 70 cable yarder. You know, working the old ways here, yeah, it's obviously poor soil type when it gets wet. We try and keep the yarding distance down under about three or four hundred metres, but we can go further if needed. Our production target's somewhere around two, two hundred and fifty tonne a day. Ideally, we'd need seven people to operate it but finding it hard to get staff so we're meeting our targets with four or five people at present. We have a 30 ton excavator and that certainly increases production and speeds things up but obviously in some places the terrain's too steep or too wet and we have to go back to using stumps in, in which case production does drop. Everything's done on signals. There is voice communication as well, but everything's done on signals. One of the main advantages is everybody within a 2K radius knows what's going on. So whether they're watching or not, they know exactly what's going on behind them or in front of them or wherever. It's, it's not dependent on the terrain. There's no limit as to the angle we can go. We've done yarded areas that have been 45 degrees plus. The premium grade for us here is high quality saw log and then 
two or three export grades, depending on the branch size mainly. And then last of all is pulp, which is basically everything that doesn't fit the above grades. Fallers still play an important part in the harvesting of the, of the pine. Good fallers are highly skilled and they can place trees in the best position for the machines to be able to pick them up and get them up to the landing. But where access is easier, fella bunches are used and they're picked up with forwarders then and carted up to the landing that way. These machines are all worked by computers and uh, they actually cut it up to lengths and it's all graded and the limbs are taken off and the bark's taken off, all mechanically. The logs are now graded and sorted out ready for transport to the AKD mill in Colac or Ballarat, where they're cut up into structural grade timber. The uh, poorer quality and head logs are taken down to the chipper in July. AKD is an acronym for Associated Kiln Dryers and as the name implies it, it was formed by a group of hardwood sawmillers from the local region that um, formed the company in order to further kiln dry and value add their hardwood resource. So the four families that uh, were part of the consortium that got AKDs or as it was then Associated Kiln Dryers together were the Hayden family, the, the Bennett family, Calco family and the English family. Those four family companies are, are still represented on the board today and are still the, the uh, owners of AKD. The history goes way back to the 1800s with my family when my grandfather moved to the uh, Otway region and commenced sawmilling and then my father after him and then uh, AKD was formed in the early 50s and uh, that link is unbroken. In the early 60s, tenders were released by the then Forest Commission of Victoria for the softwood resource that was now reaching maturity in the Air Valley. And they were successful in that tender to the Forest Commission and basically that was the formation of AKD as a softwood sawmilling enterprise. In those days, when the company first um, won the tender, they were bringing in a, less than 10,000 cubic metres of logs per annum. Um, today we are cutting nearly 400,000 cubic metres of log. The logs are not all sourced from the, the Otway region, they are sourced from the three distinct regions in the state, the Otways, Ballarat and uh, what is called the Rennick region which is near the South Australian border. We have approximately 12,000 acres of our own freehold land and we've been um, developing these plantations since the uh, early 70s in order to enhance our resource security. It doesn't supply all of our requirements, obviously, for our 400,000 cubic metre input. We get about 10% off our own plantations. To support that 400,000 cubic metres, we require a land base of about 40,000 hectares. There's about 10 B double loads of logs come in every day and uh, we clear fall the, the equivalent of about four hectares or ten acres every day of pine plantations to support the volume that we are processing. 
The main product that we produce here are, are structural grade products which go into the housing market. We produce enough timber here to build about 10 houses a day. We do export a small amount of uh, furniture grade timber into China and that's obviously an area of growth. We've um, invested um, a lot of money in automation, in handling and in the processing side. Our mills are modern and we can compete not only on the Australian market but internationally. We employ about 180 people here in Colac and we're a significant contributor to the local economy. So we would feed into the local economy about $12 million by way of wages and goods and services that we procure for the running of the business. In addition to the 180 permanent uh, staff, we uh, have considerable number of subcontractors who rely on us for their income, and that is uh, logging contractors, cartage contractors, and some service industries in repairs and maintenance in the local town. During the milling process, uh, we recover around about 50% in sawn timber, and the other 50% is made up of, uh, of wood chip, sawdust, and bark. The bark is sold to uh, Debco, who make uh, garden mulch and potting mix from that. The sawdust is burnt for our kiln drying process to produce heat and the wood chip is sent down to Geelong where we operate a joint venture facility with Hancock Plantation Victoria for export of wood chip to Japan. SPE, Softwood Plantation Exporters, is a uh, joint venture between Hancock Victorian Plantations, who are plantation owners and managers, and AKD Softwoods, which is a sawmill in Colac. Once the roundwood is delivered to the mill, we uh, go through the process of chipping the roundwood. The 120 foot radial crane unloads the truck and feeds the infeed, which then uh, rolls through into the debarker. The in-feed deck then takes the logs now debarked through to the chipper and once chipped they're conveyed all the way to the grain court facility where they're stored. We uh, chip straight into the shed. The dozers within the shed are pushing into a hatch and the chips are then loaded out from a conveyor underneath the floor of the shed right to the ship at the um, pier. During the loading of a vessel, every 100 tonne we take a one kilo sample for testing. We continually check our chip for size and fibre content. We do regular moisture analysis and regular size checks. The vessel we're loading at the moment is, like most chip vessels, has six hatches, six individual hatches, with approximately 3.6 million cubic feet of storage space. Things going well? Okay. Nice and steady, right? Everything's going well, so we're lucky here because there is no uh, air draft limit. Yes. And uh, we don't have to stop for a long time the ballasting. Yes. So we can yes. always cope up with the loading. Yeah. And we will have all the ballast finished before the loading before the, lo the loading is finished. When we're loading a vessel, the most important thing is compaction and uh, we have many ways of trying to improve the compaction. Uh, we try and fan the chips in so that they float in nicely into the hatches within the vessel. We also fill to a percentage, about 75%, and then put a dozer in to push around and fill up any corners and uh, just to generally push the chips into places that we can't load into. 
loading of a vessel takes approximately 70 hours, uh, just on three days, to um, fill completely. And on final trimming of each hatch, we put the dozer back in just to flatten it out before we close the lids. Once uh, it's all cleaned and tied down, the ship will head off and uh, make its way to Japan. Our ability to expand beyond our, our current input is very much dependent on the resource available. So the challenge for the future for our company is to uh, expand the plantation resource base and that's what we've been doing over the last year with some major acquisitions of land base to increase our plantings to ensure that not only what we're cutting now is sustainable but uh, that we actually have growth into the future. The industry is uh, on a very sound footing and it's environmentally sustainable because we're on plantation development on private land and that'll be what will sustain us uh, well into the future. Artways for selection in those days. Back in the 1800s, the settlers then came. The sight unseen, they came in to farm the Otway Range. Otway Ridge beat forest and the air valley way. But farmers they were not, and many doomed to fail. They worked it hard that time, vowing they would stay. No road to tracks to speak of, just a tough mountain range, a harsh unyielding country, and ever constant rain. And they built their shacks and bark huts, and yards for stock of those days. But one by one they gave up, and left and went away. 